Good morning. Please stand for the ringing of the bell as it calls us into worship this morning. to have you here. Uh, my name is Carrie Schaefer. I'm the director of youth here at the church. Pastor Bob is on vacation this Sunday. Um, so we have the pleasure of having um, Pastor Dallas Rosted here with us to give us the message this morning. Um, so we are excited and thank you for coming. Just a few announcements before we move into worship. Um, <clears throat> this Thursday, February 24th, there will be a crocheting class here at the church from four to six if you want to join in that. Um, Ash Wednesday is upon us which is hard to believe. So that is a week from this coming Wednesday. So we will again be having soup and sandwich every Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30 downstairs. And then there will be a Lenten journey um, Bible study up in the fireside room from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, and also tubing tomorrow with our youth. Well, as of right now, it's still on, but we'll see how tomorrow goes. We're not really sure how the weather will um, cooperate with that. But um, And then also, for anybody who's in leadership, that meeting is postponed until um, March 1st, so next Tuesday. Um, and what else was I supposed to announce? Um, Nancy asked me to announce uh, Grand Pads. If you are in person who does not like technology, the Rose Center has a grant for free grand pads to use so it's like an iPad but it's got it's more simple and has bigger icons for people that um, want things more simple with technology so if you're interested in that um, you can go to the Rose Center um, and get more information otherwise Nancy got one so you could ask her questions as well and then finally next Saturday, the 26th, there is a memorial service here at the church for Elizabeth Lingo, who recently passed away. So that is all coming up. So any more announcements, please look in your bulletin. And with that, we will move on to our opening hymn this morning, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, verses, uh, the first and last verse. And you may be seated <clears throat> and please join in the call to worship this morning um, and read responsibly for the congregation two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him one on his right and one on his left then Jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And here ends our call to worship. Um, and if all of our little kiddos could come up this morning.
Good morning. Long time no see. There we go. It's on. Been a while. Haven't seen you for a while. All right. <clears throat> what is this? A pencil. A pencil. What does it have on the end? An eraser. An eraser. Okay. What can you do with a pencil? Write. Write. Draw. Erase. Erase. Right? Okay. So when you're writing and you make a mistake, what do you do? You use the eraser. You use the eraser. Okay? That's right. You use the eraser on the end of a pencil. God's forgiveness is sort of like this eraser. Because we all make mistakes, right? Yes. And God is always ready to forgive us when we ask him. And just like this eraser removes our mistakes, God's forgiveness can remove our sins very good like that, right? He takes them away. So I know I make a lot of mistakes. So let's look at this pencil. This one I've used for a while. What's, what's different about this pencil? There's no eraser, right? There used to be, but I used it all. All right, so what do I do if this is the only pencil I have and I make a mistake? Okay. Or you can get another piece of paper, that's right. I can't erase anymore, right? So I have to live, I might have to live with the mistakes, kind of like a pen, right? If I write with a pen and there's no eraser on a pen, right? Yes. So, but God's not like that. If we run out of an eraser and we have to live with that, but we don't have to do that with God. So the 23rd Psalm says that God prepares a table for us and he goes so far that our cup overflows. So that means God gives us all the love and forgiveness we need. And that's never ending. We talked about that last week at church too, right? Yes. So even when we're out of an eraser, we can still ask God to forgive us time and time again. Now, what did we talk about on Wednesday? That doesn't mean we keep doing the same mistake over and over and over again, right? We have to try and do better. But even though we may do something again, or we make that same mistake twice or three times or four times or whatever, God will forgive us. All right, so let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for forgiving us and forgiving us and forgiving us and forgiving us and having that never-ending eraser. And we just thank you for always remembering, always being there to love us and to share your love with us and to give us that forgiveness time and time again. And we just thank you for that. Amen. All right, and as we move into a time of a prayer this morning, um, I will lead you in the prayer, um, and we'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. So if you'll join me in prayer, please. Dear Lord, we are so thankful to be here together today in your house. This is such a special place for us. Help us to remember why we are here. We are here to help grow in our relationship with you, Lord. We are here to be good neighbors to those around us, to listen to each other and encourage one another in love. Help us during this time as we prepare for a transition in this church. I would just ask for peace. Help all of us to come together in love and embrace the past and openly look forward to the future. Lord, I would ask for your blessings on those who are not here in person with us today. Be with them. Wrap your arms around them, Lord, and let them know we miss them and we are praying for them. We pray for those that are sick and healing and for those who are grieving who have recently lost a loved one. Help give them peace and help them hold on to those precious memories until they can meet again. I would also ask your blessing upon all of those who are working, Lord. There are so many people who are out there giving it their all every day. Our teachers, our healthcare workers, our law enforcement, to our laborers, and everyone in between. We thank them because without everyone using their gifts, the world would not be able to function. 
and we need everyone, so please give them energy and peace and rest. And Lord, help us not to worry. We know there is so much going on in this world, and tensions are so high across the whole, the whole planet, Lord. Help us to understand that you are in charge and that our worrying isn't going to get us anywhere. Help us to give our worries to you and to let them go. And finally, we just thank you for the gift of today. Thank you for this beautiful sunshine and the nice weather today. We know there's snow coming, but let us not worry about that. Thank you to Dallas for the message we are about to hear and help us move through our day with love and gratitude. And we ask this in your name. And now if you'll please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then we have another song, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. And if you will please stand. may be seated. And I would ask Deb to come up to read this morning's scripture reading. Today's scripture is Matthew chapter 18 verse 21 through 35 found in the New Testament. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? 
up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded that he be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the master of that slave felt compassion, and he released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he would pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had happened. Then summoning him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Here ends today's reading. Thank you, Deb. And now I would like to introduce um, our guest um, person giving the message this morning, my brain uh, forgives me, uh, Pastor Dallas Rosted. So. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah, my name is Dallas Rosted. I, have, uh, I was with you all. Um, y'all, y'all. Uh, I think it was maybe a year ago. It was two years ago. I don't know. Ever since COVID hit, all the years kind of come together. It's been six years since COVID started, right? And it's like, it feels that way to me anyway. And, um, and so anyway, I know I was here. Um, one thing I didn't realize until I got here, it was that I didn't realize your carpet was purple and that I would be matching this morning. <laughs> Hopefully I don't disappear into the uh, purpleness that is up here. It's a beautiful sanctuary though. I remember it being just... Yeah, just like this. Beautiful. Stained glass windows. I, I, I am a pastor currently at a, uh, it's an independent charismatic church in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. I was in the United Methodist Church for about nine years at Grace United Methodist in Fergus Falls. And uh, yeah, so my background is there. That's where I got my education, my Master's of Divinity is through the United Methodist Church. I'm still Wesleyan, whole, whole and through. And uh, you'll, you'll probably gather that as we <laughs> go through the scriptures here together this morning. But it is indeed an honor to be with you. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to doing this, to sharing the word with you. Let, let's pray uh, before we begin. Father, I am, uh, I am grateful for this opportunity to gather with brothers and sisters in another part of, uh, of Minnesota uh, that we get to gather together and look at your scriptures and see what your Holy Spirit would want to speak to us here today. May these not be my words, Father. May, be, may they be words that are sanctioned by your Holy Spirit that would go forth, Father, into our hearts that would, that would bring change. We know that no man can do that, no woman can do that, uh, only you can, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we welcome your Spirit here today. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I have five children. And um, yeah, they're uh, ages 11 to 2. Okay, 
11 to 2. And, some, and I have people in the congregation ask me, uh, you know, are you guys going to have any more? And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, I have five. That's, that's good enough. Um, no, I, I, I love my kids. I do. But my kids, uh, like, well, and I, I don't know, but your, your children, about your children. Um, but my children tend to uh, get in, in each other's ear a little bit about things. And so uh, just even yesterday, I had my four-year-old and my two-year-old that were uh, fighting. And, um, and, and it was very serious. It was very serious. This is a crisis in my home about who is going to play with the kinetic blocks and who gets the certain ones to create the certain things. And, um, and, there's only, and there's only so many of certain types of blocks to make certain structures, right? So a four-year-old, a two-year-old, they're gonna, say, they're gonna fight about this. And it was bad. Uh, when I entered the scene, because my six-year-old ran upstairs to come and tell me about what was happening, and I came down there and I entered the scene, fists were flying. These are two little girls. Two years old and four years old, fisticuffs over these blocks. And of course, me, you know, being the very kind and gentle and compassionate father, I came in. <laughs> and I said, what are you guys doing? This is ridiculous. This is over blocks. Don't you understand? This is over blocks. And Raya, my four-year-old, looks up and she says, yes, daddy, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's over blocks. And they were, they, were, they were upset with one another. The thing was, not ten minutes later, that I go down there and they were playing peacefully together building blocks, and they're best friends. And matter of fact, it was probably, I don't know, a few hours later, my daughter came up to me and, and she said, you know, she said, Daddy, Tansy, that's the two-year-old, she said, Tansy's my best friend. I said, oh, that's sweet. And, I, and you guys know, from parents, you understand, when your kids get along, that's just awesome, right? It just gives you some of this, this warm, fuzzy, uh, and I love it. And, and, I, and I saw just even a picture of what we're going to talk about here today, and this idea of forgiveness. And what we see in children. And um, Matthew 18, if you look at the whole chapter, Jesus is really, he's, he, after the first couple of verses, it's pr primarily mostly Jesus speaking. And he's, he's talking about a few different things. He's talking about when there's a fence and someone has sinned against you and what that process should look like. And so maybe some of you have been through um, the rule of Christ. Anybody been through the rule of Christ training in here? Uh, through the United Methodist Church. You haven't. Oh, you need to. It's a great training. And it's based off the scripture in Matthew 18. This idea that when someone sins against you, you go directly to that person. Boy, some of us can learn a lot from just that principle right there. Instead of going to everyone else, we go directly to the person who's offended us. If that person's un unwilling to hear us, then we take someone with us. That's when you invite someone else in. And then you go to that person. The two of you go to that person to try to reason with them. And if at that point they still aren't willing to reconcile, they still aren't willing to listen, then you take them before the church, which in, in your polity, in your church governance, is the uh, SPRC, which um, is, is it's fantastic when you have to deal with members of the SPRC in here. It's great when you have to deal with issues within the congregation, isn't it? Isn't that great when you have all the consternation and fighting? You just want to sit and have meetings over that, don't you? Oh, but it's, it's a reality, isn't it? I mean, even though we may not be four and two years old fighting over blocks, we fight. We're humans. We tend to do that. We have a will and a desire. And Jesus knows all this of us because he created us. He understands that. He was there at the very beginning when we were created. He knows what our tendencies are. And that's why he said this. He said, look, you need to become like little children. And I think of that with my four-year-old, my two-year-old. And it's not that we fight over blocks, it's that we need to become like that, but it's in that area of forgiveness where they're willing to, to overlook what was very intense just moments before to the point where they're willing to play with one another again. And what the terrible thing that happens is when we become adults, we don't want to play blocks with each other again. We tend to divide, we tend to uh, push away, we tend to push out. And Jesus says, no, 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 <laughs> not in my kingdom. That's not what my kingdom is about. And so we see this in Matthew chapter 18, uh, beginning with verse 21. And we read this uh, just a little bit, but we're going to go through this uh, together here this morning by way of this message. Then Peter came up and said to him, to Jesus, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? 
up to seven times. So a, a teaching that was going on in that day by many rabbis was this idea that you would you'd forgive people two and three times if they've offended you. And then after that, you don't have to do it anymore. And so that was kind of a common teaching that was going around during that day. And so Peter said, well, I'm going to even go further than that. I'm going to be even more holy than that. So how, what, what should we do, Lord? What do you think? Should we forgive him seven times? I'm pretty awesome, right, God? Right, Jesus? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. Whoa, that's, that's, that's different. That's, that's insurmountable, maybe even in the mind of Peter at the time. Jesus, essentially what he was saying to Peter is like, there is no limit to what you're supposed to do when it comes to forgiveness. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king. So this is what Jesus typically does, right? He gives into a story to help us understand. The kingdom of heaven is, is not something that is easy for us to understand as humans. We're so used to this world, the material parts and the natural part of this world, that we don't see beyond typically. And so Jesus has to help us by giving us a real life example. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, what does 10,000 talents mean to you? Probably not a lot. In this day, though, just to give you perspective, the total tax levy in all of Palestine, okay, in all of Palestine was 800 talents a year. The whole region of Palestine. And this guy owed the master 10,000. There's another part of this that, that we don't maybe and with Western eyes and, and our thinking think about in this situation is that, and these guys would have been thinking about this when Jesus was speaking this, is the fact that this guy had to be stealing from his master to, to, to create such a huge debt, to create such a huge amount of debt that he could never pay back like that. He had to have been stealing from his master. So there's some things going on. Not just does he owe all this to his pastor, but he was stealing. And when he had begun to settle them, these accounts, one who owed him the 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded that he be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had in repayment be made. One man works 20 years for one talent. 20 years it takes just to get one talent. And another uh, thought on this too is the idea of 10,000. I wanted to see what that word was in the Greek. So, because I don't have the Greek just spinning through my mind all the time, I have to go and look it up. And so I did. And the Greek word for 10,000 has this idea to it. it, was, uh, it this was used for, yeah, 10,000, but it was really used as, as a, a, a word for a large number that is, a large number that is innumerable. You cannot count it. So basically Jesus should have been saying, you, or, or you could have said in this parable, he could have said, this guy owed him a bazillion dollars. Because that is just how insurmountable this debt was to be paid. So this is the point Jesus really wants us to get. It's impossible to repay this on your own. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Could this guy repay him? He can't. He can't. Yet he's begging for mercy. This is a picture that we see of repentance. And he's begging for his mercy, but he could never repay the master what he owes him. Jesus is, is telling us something here. He's telling Peter something here. Lord, should I, should, I, should I forgive them seven times? And so Jesus is like, you need to remember something about who you are, Peter. And he's saying to us, we have something we need to remember about ourselves as well. We can't repay it on our own. We owe him everything. And the master of that slave, in response to what the slave did, in response, the master of that slave felt Compassion, And again, I looked at the Greek word for felt compassion. I wanted to see what did that mean because I see feel compassion. And I don't know what pictures you get 
I think with words and word word pictures and passion, and I, and it just didn't seem like it had enough to it for me. And so, and typically the way it is when you look up a Greek words, it has so much more meaning to it. It's this idea of the inward parts, especially the nobler entrails, the heart, lungs, liver, and kidneys. These gradually come to denote the seat of the affections. Everything within him felt compassion for this guy. This guy stole from him an amount that he could never pay back. And yet he felt that compassion for this guy. Everything that this guy had done to him, and yet he felt compassion. This is his slave. He could have done whatever he wanted with him. But he had compassion. Doesn't this give us a picture of who our Heavenly Father is? This is who our Heavenly Father is. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Jesus wants us all in that place. He wants us all to realize that we can't do it, that we don't have enough to repay it. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who wants all people. And I looked up the Greek word for all. Guess what it means? All. Pretty simple. All people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the heart of our God. And of course, John 3, 16 through 17. So probably a verse most of us know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 is my favorite, though. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. That is the heart of our father. Compassion. He felt compassion on this slave. Verse 28. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, denarii is about a day's wage. So this guy owed him about, you know, whatever, a third of a year, what, four months' wages. Is that repayable? Ah, I'd probably take a little bit, but it's repayable. It's, some, it's a debt that could be repaid. So this slave who had been forgiven, who had been before Jesus and, and pleading his case, has now gone and found someone who owed him a debt that could be repaid. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. This is the Christian who is offended and forgets what they have been forgiven of. This is when we forget about that insurmountable debt that we have before our king, before our master. This is an uncomfortable truth, but it's one we need to remember. Because the, the offense and the hurt and the pain that we hold on to, that we keep to ourselves, that we use against other people as weapons, only hurts us and keeps us further from our master. It only says this, that there really, it really isn't an insurmountable debt that we owe the master. Actually, we're pretty good people. It just says that basically all people are just good. Really, it isn't an insurmountable debt. But the scriptures are very clear to us. And until we come to that place that we fully realize... It, now, we could ask the question, did this slave who went... And, this guy who just owed him a little bit of money... And treated him this way. Did he fully, really understand the gravity of what he owed his master? Because if he did, would he have treated the slave this way? Romans 6.23 says this. The wages of sin is death. That's where sin takes us. You can't repay that on your own. You can't be good enough. You can't come to do enough church services. You can't go to enough Bible studies. You can't do any of those things. The only thing you can do is come wide open on your knees, weeping and begging and saying, God, forgive me. 
If you notice what he said, though, right, the, the slave initially, the one that owed him, owed the master all the money, he said, look, you just, just have patience with me, show compassion, uh, I'll pay you back. He still had in his mind that he could do it. He could do this on his own. And I think that's where we're seeing, that's sort of a foreshadowing to how he's going to treat this particular slave. So, this, so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me. I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he would pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had happened. And then summoning him, his, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You pleaded with me. You, 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 you made it seem like you were repentant. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master moved with anger and the Greek word there for anger is like a settled opposition. It was clear at that point that this slave had no intentions of being compassionate, had no intentions of really being repentant of what he owed. He was in opposition to the master. And so with this anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. My Heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, well, that's an encouraging message to us. Thank you. I'm so glad you came to Painesville. <laughs> Let's think of the heart. The heart is your mind, your character, your inner self, your will, the intention, the center of who you are. It's the seat of your emotions. And unless you forgive from that place, unless you forgive from that place, our Heavenly Father can't be in that, in that role with us as our Master. As a matter of fact, he, He's now in opposition to us. He's, it's in a settled opposite state. Don't get caught up in the wording of tortured and, and all that sort of stuff. Get caught up in this. That you are in opposition to your Heavenly Father. That you are apart from Him. Now we know the heart of our God. We just looked at the Scriptures. The scriptures are very clear, and I just shared a few of them with you, that the heart of God is that everyone would be saved. He's not going around looking to see if, if you're doing the right things, and if you're not, and if you, oh, you've done six bad things and four good things, well, that's not enough. I'm just going to push you out. That's not how God works. He is wanting everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to come to that place to understand what is owed. But the thing we do, I know, I'll say the thing I do. The thing I do is I tend to come to God, and I, I would never say this outright, but this is my attitude, is that, God, you don't, I understand you want me to forgive everyone, but you don't get it. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the hurt. You, ha you don't understand the pain. You don't understand those things. Now, I would never outright say that, because theologically, that's stupid to do. <laughs> but in my heart, that's where I go. Maybe some of you are like me. Now, I'm, I've had to deal with this. I have lots of pain in my life. I have things I've had to deal with. The last six years of my life have been some of the, if I had to stand up here and share with you some of the things, I'm telling you, there, I've, God has pushed me in this area. Let's just put it that way. People have caused great harm to me that I've had to look in the face and ask for forgiveness for. That I've held, I've held tension towards. And that has hurt me and gripped me in pain. It, it was interesting. Just even, just even this issue of divorce. Because my parents got divorced when I was nine. <clears throat> and for most of my life, I, had, I, I thought I was okay with that. Meaning, I saw the fighting. I saw all of it. They, it look, I don't blame them. They were kids having kids. My dad was 18. My mom was 16 when I was born. So I get that. 
And so there was fighting, and then there was partying and drinking, and all that sort of and different sorts of abuses happening in the home at that time. And praise God, both of them know Jesus now and are serving him. But in those days, no, they weren't. They were broken people. And broken people tend to, hurt people tend to do things, don't they? They tend to hurt other people. And they hurt me. And I didn't fully come to grasp with that until I was 35 years old. <laughs> I thought I was good because I was like, oh, I, I understand all the fighting and everything. I'm glad that they separated. Now they both know Jesus and everything. Oh, that, this is good. This is all part of, of what God wanted. But I, and I stuffed all those feelings that I had about what happened in and through those days of my life and with my parents. And it wasn't until I was 35 years old and I went to a youth convention and I was sitting and I actually I went, it's like, oh, I'm going to go to this session about, about uh, a divorce and trauma with, with, uh, with students. I went there intending to learn how to better minister to, to my students. And I sat there in the back row of that particular session and I wept. The whole time. God bringing up all sorts of things that I just stuffed. And believe me, I'm 75% Norwegian. I can stuff emotions. I'm good at that. But instead, I think what God wanted me to do is come face to face with those offenses. He wanted me to come face to face with those things. And to work through them. And I experienced freedom. I hadn't experienced it up to that point. And I continue to experience freedom. The more forgiveness that I can give. I wanted to share a story with you. And again, I, this isn't meaning to get dark. It's just meant to, to give an example. October 2nd, 2006. West Nickel Mines had a, a, a place called the West Nickel Mines. Had a, a very terrible thing happen. A uh, gentleman by the name of Charles Roberts, for whatever reason one day, decided that he was going to get up and take a gun with him. And he was going to go to an Amish school out in the middle of a field. Literally, the school was built out in the middle of a field. He went in there and decided he was going to go in there and do some very nasty things. And he did that. He went in there, and as the story goes, he... Uh, made the male teacher leave and all the boys from the room and it was just girls in there. There was ten of them. And he bound them all up and put them in the front of the room and he began to shoot them. Killing five, wounding five. But before taking his own life. Now, this happened in the morning of October 2nd, 2006. By the afternoon of that same day, after the news had gotten out, the wife, Charles, Charles Roberts, by the way, a, a good dad, had three young kids, was very involved in their lives, had a great marriage, everything. They still to this day don't fully understand why he did what he did, other than in his, in his uh, letter, he did leave a letter. Uh, he had made some statements about a child that they had lost early on, and that he was mad at God about it. Unforgiveness. Even to God. But what I want to talk to you about here this morning in regards to all this is the response of the Amish community. So his wife had gone over to her parents' place. And I'm, and I'm sure it was a very emotional, very distraught time. Uh, this is an article from the Washington Post. And it reads this. This is her over at her parents' place. And she's, uh, uh, this is what happened. Hours after learning about what Charles Roberts had done, a contingent of the grieving Amish came to visit her, his wife. Roberts' wife recalled that she was standing in her parents' kitchen and she could see a group of the Amish walking toward her parents' home. Her father offered to go outside and talk to them. Quote, and I couldn't hear the words they were saying, but I could see the exchange that was happening. I could hear their arms extending, or I could see their arms extending, and, and the way they laid their hands on my dad's shoulder. I could feel it, she said. I could feel the emotion of the moment. You know, it said everything, she said, adding that her father said they had forgiven her husband. 
They were concerned about me and concerned about the kids and wanted to know that, and wanted us to know that they supported our family. It didn't end there. When our family was besieged by media en route to bury Charles Roberts, the Amish stepped in again. Even though they didn't, ha didn't like to have their pictures taken, members of the community placed themselves directly in front of the news cameras to shield her family, Monville said. Quote, they turned their backs to the cameras so, so the only pictures that could be taken were of them and not of our family. And it was amazing to me that they would choose to do that for us, she said. It was amazing. It was one of those moments during the, during the week where my breath was taken away, but not because of the evil, but because of the love. Lewis Smead says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Francis of Assisi says this, It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. The Amish understood this. The Amish understood that this great evil and this horrible thing that had happened, and it wasn't going to do anyone any good for them to just lash out in anger, to come in the same spirit as this man did in violence and anger, but in, instead in compassion and mercy and love. And this is what our Heavenly Father expects of us as followers of Jesus, is to be like this. Here's one thing I can't stand about our society right now. I'm just going to love with you. I just can't stand it. I'm, I'm a guest speaker, so I'm just going to say it. Um, I, I, I can't stand that in our society we think, when I say we, I'm talking about all of us, that we somehow think that we can measure the pain and suffering that other people go through. I don't like how we, how we can look into the lives of people and say, well, they've suffered this, and they've suffered this. Well, that's worse than this. Now, I mean, there's some obvious things, right? But who's to say that the pain and the oppression and the abuse that someone, that one person has experienced and that the other, one per, other person has experienced isn't just as bad or worse than one than the other? How do we know those things? We don't. And to say that we do, well, to me, to say that we do, we remove the master from his place and we put ourselves in that position. And we think we know better than the master does. God has called us to do something as followers of him, as imagers of our Heavenly Father. He's called us to forgive. And this is one of the primary position points For us as believers, we are to be known as a people that forgive. We can't be known as a people who cancel and push other people out. We got to be known as a people that strive for reconciliation with others. As far as it is, uh, as far as it be unto us, as what Paul says in the book of Romans, he says, as far as it depends on us, live at peace with all men. As far as it depends on you. And for you and your relationships, you're the only one that can do that. I can't do that for you as much as I would love to do it. I can maybe help, but ultimately, as far as it depends on you, you decide whether or not you're going to live at peace with your fellow human beings. I was listening to a program on the way here, and I don't know why I did this. I should have been listening to like worship music or something, but I didn't. And I was listening to some political thing. And they're talking about the, the, uh, the, the coming civil war that's going to happen in our, in, our, in our society. Can we as a church and as followers of Jesus be different than that? Can we make a conscious decision not to fall into those lines and instead reflect what our Heavenly Father wants? As he did to this servant early on in this particular narrative when he felt compassion from everything that was within him towards him and wanted to forgive and forgave his debt that he could not pay back, that he wronged him over? Can we do that with those that we are in opposition to? With those who have hurt us? With those who have oppressed us? I close with this. 
We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. I agree with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have shown us grace. Grace means an unmerited favor, a gift. You've given to us with nothing that we've done to earn it. You've given us that, Father. And you've given us salvation, even though we don't deserve it. And so this morning, we want to proclaim we're grateful for that. And we want that to be in the forefront of our minds so that when our brothers and sisters do things to offend us, when we are playing with blocks that they want or... We're playing with blocks that uh, you know, they want, they want ours, or whatever the case might be. Father, no matter what that is happening in those situations, God, that we would have that compassion from the, our inmost being, Father, that we would think of others before ourselves. We think of your love and what it means. It's an agape love, which means a love that is without condition. And so, Father, may that be said of us as we go forth from this, forth from this place. We give you all the honor and the glory this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that message. That was wonderful. And now if the ushers would come forward, we'll receive this morning's offering. Lord, we just thank you for this offering. Help us to use it um, to serve your word, to serve you. And thank you for the gifts as we are able. Amen. And our closing hymn this morning is Living for Jesus. Please join us in singing.
Now may we all go from this place to live, to forgive, and to show compassion to our neighbor, to those who have offended us. And Father, may we have the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit to be able to do so. We give you all the honor and glory and power and praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>